Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. I love Jesus. I hope you do too. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, I hope I can conclude the study on Satan or the devil. I've got a lot of verses to go through. I'm going to try to go through them fairly quickly. And uh, uh, I've already covered a lot of ground now. I've had uh, three parts already to this study. And it's, um, even though there's a lot of verses to go through, some of the points will be a little bit repetitive. So I think I can cover them quickly. Um, Secretly, though, I'm actually quite excited about going on to next week's study which is the question that uh, Brother Joseph brought forward. Uh, Sebastian Dresden posed an interesting question about the eternal existence of Jesus, uh, uh, how he existed before the incarnation, how he came into existence, did he come into existence? Uh, a lot of, it's, it's gonna be a fascinating study, uh, but uh, I'm going to try to finish talking about the devil today and see what we can learn about him from all the scriptures that have the the term Satan or the name Satan and the devil in it. So I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. I'm going to go to John 13, 27 first. It says, uh, after the piece of bread, then Satan entered him. Then said Jesus to him, what you do, do quickly. So the question is, uh, is, it says Satan entered him. We know that this is uh, referring to uh, uh, to Judas. This takes place at the Last Supper, and it says that Satan entered him. There's another verse talking about Judas, and it refers to him as the devil. Um, So what what does it mean that Satan entered him? And does it mean that it was Satan specifically? That's where you see when we go through all these other verses that have the term devil or Satan in it, uh, it doesn't always mean necessarily that it was Satan himself uh, or the devil himself. Sometimes it means that it was just a demonic force. Uh, being, Being possessed by the devil doesn't always mean you're possessed by Satan himself. Maybe it's possessed by devils or one of Satan's uh, demons. So this uh, tells us that uh, Satan actually entered into Judas. So we know that sometimes Satan, the devil, or the demons can actually enter into a human being. Now there's been a question about demon possession and, and that it is can a Christian be possessed by a demon? And the answer is really pretty obvious. Uh, um, We cannot be possessed by any demon because we are already possessed by a spirit, the Holy Spirit. There's no room for another spirit to come into us because I'm occupied by the Holy Spirit and I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. So no demon can possess me. But that doesn't mean that demons cannot um, attack me. You can be under demonic attack, and that's why we're taught how to deal with it by putting on the full armor of God. So it is not unusual for uh, a Christian to be under a demonic attack. But it is not only unusual, but I will even say it is impossible for a Christian to be actually possessed by a demon. So now I'm going to move on to another verse. Uh, Let's look at Luke 
22:31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have you that he might sift you as wheat. So this is Jesus talking to Simon, which is Simon Peter, which most commonly we refer to him as Peter. Let's look at that in the uh, uh, Luke 22:31. Look at it in context. Luke 22:31. Um, all right when you study a verse it's it's critically important that you look at it in context there's a saying that a a text taken out of context can be a pretext and the pretext is that uh, there are people who are purposely twist, twisting the scriptures and they'll pull a text out of context and it seems to mean one thing but when you look at the core cool context of the setting then it's clear that uh, uh what it really means so let's look at this in context uh verse 31 is what we're looking for so i'm going to start with verse 24 here a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the, young, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Let's read on. Verse 33 says, But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Verse 34. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me. You'll deny three times that you know me. So there's a lot to be learned in this section. But uh, uh, obviously, this is before the Jesus is arrested and tried and, and executed. And as usual, Peter is boasting of his his faithfulness to Jesus, and that uh, he says, "I, uh, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death." Well, we know that's not the way it played out. Of course, he did take up a sword and cut off the ear of one of the guards, and uh, Jesus rebuked him and said, "If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword." So he did attempt to defend Jesus and perhaps he would have if Jesus hadn't stopped him uh, but the way it played out is that Peter yeah, like the rest of the apostles uh, they all ran for their, their lives and hit out and yeah, but um, the real question here regarding to Satan is Jesus says to Satan, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I prayed for you. I don't understand how Satan is asking. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we should look at this in another translation. 31, verse 31. Let's look at this in... Uh, uh, let's 
NIV verse 31. I mean, no, but let's look at it at the KJV. That's what I thought I had originally. Verse 31. Okay. Verse 31 makes more sense to me. KJV. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Okay. This is what we really should have looked at in the first place. So in this verse, in this translation, uh, Satan is not asking for permission to sift all of them. He, in this verse, it states that Satan desires to have one of them. And it's specifically saying, have you. There's no reference to the others. It doesn't say all of you. So I think this is an important distinction here in the KJV that uh, he's talking to Simon Peter and he's telling Simon Peter that he's going to um, be under this terrible trial and uh, Satan would like to, would like to, desires to have him and sift him like wheat. And Jesus is praying for him. Um, well, we know how that played out. Uh, Satan did uh, with Peter. Uh, I don't know if Satan was the cause of Peter, uh, if he was able to sift him like wheat and, and control him and, and, and get him to uh, hide and cower. Uh, but Jesus said he would pray for, for Peter. Okay, let's move on to the next verse here. Uh, Acts 5 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? So we know that Ananias and Sapphira had uh, brought part of the money. Again, we better look at this in context. Acts 5. Acts 5, three. Five, 3. Okay, we'll start with verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. You see, at this time, uh, church was getting just getting started and everybody was contributing to, to the church and, and selling what they had and bringing it to the apostles so that they were able to get this church started by it, and it was financially being supported and everybody was sharing that didn't last too long because communism is a system that doesn't work eventually well after a short time you don't hear about this anymore in the church where everybody's pooled all their resources and just sharing equally um, with the reason we know communism doesn't work is is because uh, man is still in the flesh and not everybody's going to contribute equally in terms of finances and in workload. And then people look and say, I'm contributing more than him and he's getting an equal share. And, and the whole thing crumbles because of that. That's why communism won't work. And, but in eternity, uh, we will have a different attitude. We will not be uh, acting according to the flesh and everybody will be making their best effort and there will be no jealousy. So, so, and there won't be no need because all our needs will be pro provided and satisfied. But um, until then, it just won't work. Uh, but in this case, the question is a lie. Ananias and his wife sold their land. Let's say they sold it for $10,000 and they brought five thousand dollars someone there hey brother bill how are you how you doing 
Yeah, well, not too bad, not too bad. I just got the link via Skype. I was looking around on Google and everywhere else. That there weren't a link posted, so I just logged into Skype. Yeah, I at first I, it wouldn't even let me copy and paste the link, and then later on I was able to. But uh, I'm glad you can make it. I don't have the phone. I'm not sure what I'm talking about. Have you, did you hear anything yet? I've, I've heard uh, basically where we talk about in the books about there was sharing. Uh, and obviously, yeah, with communism, etc., because people's nature is, is generally greedy. It just didn't work. That, that's what yeah. I got to. Okay. Uh, well, would you like to respond to, to that that premise I just made? Well, yeah, my, yeah. My response would I'm going to agree with that because human nature, unfortunately, and that's exactly why we needed a savior, tends to be selfish, and you know, as we're all fallen creatures. After time, you know, after you had the initial kind of excitement at Pentecost and, and the new church was being formed, and there was exciting times, as people kind of gradually relaxed into the church system, or this, 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 you know, this new thing, you know, I suppose the little selfishness, you know, started rearing his head again, and people obviously didn't want. We had the example of Ananias and Sapphira, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, where they held some back. They didn't need to. You know, because it was theirs to give anyway, but the selfishness crept in. They kept some back, so yeah. Okay, um, so that's where we are. We're Acts uh, chapter five, and it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, and when we look at it in context, we see uh, what I'm really looking at specifically is verse three. It says, "But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan?" Fill thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Um, so this study really today is about Satan. And uh, so I'm curious when, when Satan is mentioned here, and he's mentioned so many times like this, he seems to be blamed. Instead of Peter blaming Ananias' flesh and just his human nature and his fallen state, uh, he brings up Satan and says, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Um, we see a lot of examples of that. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to say, you know, Scripture's wrong, but, but could Peter be wrong here? And, and, uh, and you know, it, obviously the, this is a record of Peter saying that, so it, I believe he said it. In that way, I think Scripture is correct. Uh, it happened, and Peter said to them, Why hath Satan filled thine heart? But do you think Peter was necessarily right, jumping to the conclusion that Satan was the one? Uh, maybe, maybe he's correct because he certainly knew what happened. How did, how did Peter know that they didn't give the whole amount? Maybe it was revealed to, to Peter through the Holy Ghost, and so, but. Do you think that Satan is, is being accused here accurately uh, or not? That, that's a hard one. Yeah, yeah. We have to, at the end of the day, we have to take scripture for what it says. You know, and sometimes, you know, passages like this are mind blown. You know, for scholars over the years, you know, since the beginning, you know, Christendom have, have argued and debated over this one. And, you know, the way I see it, Yes, Satan did feel that you know fill their hearts. I don't believe that's in reference though to Satan possessing anyone, because it's impossible for for a saint to be possessed. But for some reason, you know, through through their that their, their their selfishness and and their folly, that they give way to you know Satan to, to fill their hearts with, with, with you know stupidity. Because it was stupid, you know. This is why it was mind boggling. You know, they, it was their, you know, their amount of money. It was them who said they'd give it to the, you know, to the, to the Apostle Street, and then they held some back. It doesn't make sense why they done that. So, yeah, there's a hard scripture. I, I just have to go with, I suppose, what the text says. But I won't read in uh, saying that, 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 you know, these Christians and an ISIS of fire were possessed by the devil because that, that doesn't say that either. So, 
Um, well, I be, before you before you joined me in uh, one or two previous verses, I did get into the topic about Satan or demons possessing people, and I made the same case that you just made that. Uh, uh, yeah, and, um, I don't think Satan himself is can't be possessing everybody because he's he's not om omnipresent. He can't possess, you know, two people at the same time or a thousand people at the same time. We know a lot of people are possessed. Is it Satan that's possessing every one of them? He, he's not omnipresent like God. So I mean, Satan could possess a person. Other demons could possess people, but it is impossible for a, a Christian to be possessed by a demon because a Christian is already possessed by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit possesses us. Uh, so you, you, you confirmed, I guess you didn't hear that part, but you confirmed what I said earlier. We certainly can't be under demonic attack and that's why we need to, as Paul instructs us, put on the full armor of God. Uh, but. Uh, getting back to this verse with uh, Peter and Sapphira, obviously they didn't have to give anything. No one was compelled to sell everything they own and give it to the apostles and share. That that wasn't like a law that was laid out. They were free to give a little bit or nothing or half or all of it. But the problem was they were lying to the as Peter said, to the Holy Ghost. That was a real issue, not the question of how much they gave, but the fact that they lied and said they gave it all. You agree with that? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and this is it. You know, they, again, it just shows you that, you know, so they had to give way to, to, to be tempted, you know, in their hearts by Satan. So they had to... You know, they were Christians, so they couldn't have been possessed, but they did obviously give way and they listened to him because he's the accuser of the brethren. You know, although we can't be possessed, I do believe Christians can be, you know, repressed, oppressed. So, you know, Satan can whisper, you know, being the accuser of the brethren in our ears, and obviously they, they hearkened on uh, Satan's voice, you know, and, and thought, well, no, it's our money, we're, we're holding some back. That's what I think. <clears throat> you mute again, Brother Luke. <laughs> Thank you. I was looking at uh, Bible Hub and not the uh, uh, the uh, video screen here. Thank you. Uh, if we if we go on in the story, we find out that uh, um, Ananias fell over dead because of this lie uh, and then later on his wife came and she was asked and she lied about it too and then she fell over dead and do you think this could be like the example of the the, the what we hear is the, the term the sin unto death oh, well it certainly was a sin unto death at this point but personally I believe the sin unto death is is uh, rejecting Christ personally, but yeah, this sin, what they did do, did lead to death. And I, and I think the reason it's unusual is that that, that many many Christians, because we're all human, have lied. You know, even you know Abraham lied a couple of times. So it wasn't it wasn't the fact that they lied that that, that they was you know taken home in that sense. I think it was because. This happened right at the birth of the new, this new church, this new way, right at the beginning. So there had to be an example laid down. And at half so it was, I can see no other reason what, why that they did actually die for lying to the Holy Ghost. Because, you know, the Holy Ghost lives in us, and, and, and sometimes we die. You know, we promise something, but they don't always give it, or we hold something back. You know, so it's, it's a really deep, deep subject and a really deep hard scripture that to, to, to grasp. Okay, uh, yeah, this is uh, the whole scene, the whole scenario there, it's, it's hard to understand. In the first case, uh, Peter is saying, why hath Satan made you do this? And, and so Satan's getting blamed for it. But Ananias and Sapphira are the ones that punished for it. 
But I've always wondered about the sinner to death uh, being. It's never made sense to me, brother. I, to me, I believe what Paul says: to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So how could it be that uh, if someone could have a sin that God says, "I'm I'm so unhappy with with what they've done. I'm going to kill them and bring them to heaven sooner." If they brought me to heaven, if he brought me to heaven sooner, how is that in a in form of punishment? It's isn't it a blessing to be able to, as Paul says, live as Christ, but to die as gain. So the concept of the sin unto death, it, I've never really understood the uh, the logic of it. Do you, do you have any response to that? Well, yeah, I, I, I can only I, the only way I can understand it is that because God knows everything and, and 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 you know because we get hints through John's epistles you know where, it's, where, where it says you know they went away from us because they was never of us and, and perhaps these people were of Christ that they was going to apostate and they was going to cause a lot of trouble you know within, within the body of Christ and and, and Cause chaos to the point where you know thousands, millions of future souls would have been at jeopardy. So perhaps the Lord said, "Right, okay, you're saved. You can't lose it. I'm taking you on." And that's that's the only scenario I can think of. Oops, you move it again, bro. <laughs> oh, boy. I have to admit that the. Uh this is something I don't claim to really understand very well. And uh, it probably, if someone listens to me long enough, they're going to find there's, there's numerous times where I'll say, I don't understand this. And um, I think that um, I don't really believe there's anybody who can honestly claim that they understand every scripture, every verse, every word. And uh, there are going to be times where we're stumped and... Uh, uh, sometimes we even we may just say, "Well, I think this is the way it is, but I'm not sure." Uh, other times we just have to honestly admit, "I just I can't explain it." Um, what do you think of the person that is uh, takes the position that you know they can understand all the scriptures? They just really got it all figured out. Uh, well, they've got to be a liar. You know, the word said. You know, let God be true and every man a liar. So, you know, I don't believe there is a human being out there that, that understands all the mysteries and revelations and, and, and fully grasp every single scripture. No, I don't believe that's the case. It's impossible. Yeah. Well, that's why I've always uh, taken the position and taught that we, we need to put um, a lot more confidence in the clear verses that are easy to understand particularly when it comes to who Jesus is and how we get saved and eternal security. The verses that are really clear, we, we can put a lot of confidence in them. They're easy to understand. They obviously say one thing. You can't really dispute it and interpret it other ways. Those are the verses we need to base our doctrine on and confidence. And then you've got all these other verses that uh, are debated and everybody's arguing about what they mean. Well, uh, those are the verses that we should be saying, look, I'm not going to base my doctrine on those verses. I, I think I understand it. I'll try to explain it, but uh, we certainly shouldn't be putting too much confidence in, in verses that are really hard for everybody to understand. Do you, you think that's a, a, a wise way to go about it or not? Well, yeah, I think that's spot on. And, and that is manifested you know, throughout history. You know, what, all these church councils for, you know, that have gone on over the years, almost from the inception of the church, you know, and they still go on now with these different councils to try and work out the scriptures and understand and glean from the scriptures. So we, we know that when, when, because we have to, because when you have those, for example, you're talking to a friend, believe it or not, today about a similar matter, that, you know, if you have a hundred verses proven eternal security in the New Testament, and you have three that seem to contradict it. Well, you have to you have to get it proportionally correct because the majority of the texts 
prove the channel security is a fact. So either the other three are erroneous, which would make God a liar, or we haven't understood him properly. And there's there's more context and, and more learn to be, to be had. So I think what you're saying is right then. The majority of the scripture, if they say something, and you come to a portion of the scripture that doesn't seem to, seem to make sense, then you have to go with what the majority of the context and the scripture is saying, and then work out these these hard and complicated uh, scriptures another time. Yeah, uh, and and this is this is part of the reason that the Bible is is so magnificent to me that uh, uh, if I was going to read a novel, let's say it's the greatest novel in the world. Let's say let's say it's Old Man in the Sea or, or whatever you you choose to say. Well, that's the great novel. Uh, I could read that novel and say, well, it really was great. And I say, I, I want to read it again. But after I read it two times, maybe three times, I'm probably going to understand it and get everything out of it that I possibly could. And there's no need, there's not even any interest to continue reading it daily. Whereas the scriptures, uh, th there's always these brand new revelations that we get from the Holy Spirit where I might have read a verse 50 times over many years uh, and, and then all of a sudden the 51st time I read it bang revelation epiphany that God's revealed it to me or sometimes I'm discussing the verse with a saint and they explain it to me and I finally get it and see the light and that's exciting so having verses that are uh, harder to understand doesn't disturb me. I just know that at some point maybe I'll see the light. I'll get the revelation, or maybe I'll have to have to die and go be with the Lord, and He'll explain it to me someday. <laughs> but that's what makes it so exciting: the, the learning these things. That you, there's no end to the learning from the scriptures. Yeah, I mean, is that is the beauty of them, and I, and I, I even believe. You know, before anyone shoots me and calls me a heretic, I even believe that, that God has deliberately done that so, so we can talk, so we can fellowship, so we can sharpen each other's eye. You know, all these reasons, you avoid avoid God, for, for some reason, for one person, a portion of scripture might be a mystery, to another that mystery has been revealed. Then they can come together in fellowship, and they can, you know, sharpen each other's eye. You know, and I believe that God, you know, in His sense of hope and His love, <laughs> made it that way, that that it touches everybody, you know, where they need to be touched. You know, that's what it's called. That it's the theonoustos, isn't it? It's God breathed the Scripture. You know, ink just like ink on paper. You know, this is living word. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I used to be a little upset, and and really. Wonder why does, did, did God have to make the scriptures so difficult in some ways? I mean, in some ways it's it's simple and clear. In other ways, it's so hard. And over the years, you know, I begin I've understood more and more of it, but it's been difficult. And I used to think, why is that? And then eventually, I did come to the same conclusion that you just stated that uh, He's done it for a reason. And those people who have um, really seek. If we, those of us who were really seeking to understand the scriptures, will take the time to continue studying, continue discussing them, then the, he he wants that in us. He wants us to have that attitude, and then he will reveal it to us. But he 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 reveals it to the people. It's like in the parable that uh, he said that uh, he's he's made spoken in parables so that some people will not understand because their heart's not right, and uh, those people who have the right attitude, then they'll understand it. And um, I, I used to have the same kind of attitude about the parables. Why? Why is he speaking in a parable, making instead of just plainly stating it? And he explained why. It's because uh, he wants us to have the right attitude. And when we get the right attitude about learning and seeking the truth, and, and our heart is right, then then uh, then he, we understand these things. I'm going to move on, but anything else on that before I move on to another verse? 
No, no, I think that's, that's fine. I think we covered that quite well and explained as humanly best you know, we can explain. Okay, brother. Now, uh, the next verse uh, I'm going to go over, and these are all verses that have the word Satan or devil in it. I'm going to go to Acts 26 18 uh, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive remission of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Uh, so, again, this has the word Satan, and it says that they will, uh, may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So, uh, how would you interpret that before we look at the context? Do you have any anything to say about it? Well, yeah, to me, that you know, turning turning to Christ it is coming out by default of the power of Satan. You know, it's not coming out of the divers temptations. It's not coming out of the you know the accusations that he throws at the saints and, and stuff like that. But it is coming out from from a position where you know we're lost to save. Mm -hmm. Uh, brother, oops, let me make sure. Okay, yeah, I thought maybe I was muted again. Uh, have you ever preached, you know, as, as a as one of the only street preachers in the world, one of the few street preachers in the world that I can actually recommend people listen to, who are really preaching the true message of salvation? I'm wondering if you have ever preached something like uh, everyone is a child of the devil and, and then apart from that we have those who get born again and then then the, we people we are ch a child of God if you're not a child of God therefore you're a child of the devil have you ever believed or uh, preached anything like that I, I, I avoid preaching that 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 particular in that particular manner, because yeah, although everybody, in a, in a vague sense, unless they're saved, kind of belongs to Satan. They don't, in, in the real sense, that Satan isn't omnipresent, and and his demons don't automatically by default possess everyone who's not saved. So although it's tempted to say, you know, if you if if, if you're not uh, you know not a Christian. You're you're a, a child of Satan. I, I think that goes too far because there's a mass sway in the middle. You know, you do get children of Satan, but the mass sway in the middle are have not been awakened or have not had the gospel preached to. You know, if they was children of Satan, you know, and that outwardly Satanist, you know, they wouldn't want to hear the gospel. They're not interested. But but the vast majority of the world, you know, that they still in a position. Where they that they are not on either side, and that's why we proclaim the gospel to them. We preach them this good news, you know, and, and we and we try to get them saved. Okay, let let's say hi to Brother Sam and and uh, welcome him. Uh, uh, thick shade, Brother Sam. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're just looking at uh, various verses that have the the name Satan or devil in it. And so we're, we're moving all around, but each verse has something interesting to discuss. And right now, well, first, why don't you just say hi to everybody, Brother Sam. Oh, hi. I, I've got the message and uh, connecting from myself. So if anyone uh, putting anything on the chat, on the side chat, I won't be able to read that. But hello, God bless you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. But, uh, sounds like an interesting topic. Uh, sorry I missed it last week. Uh, I was busy with my kid, I think. Um, but this week I was supposed to be busy, but uh, uh, the schedule was off somehow. But in any case, um, yeah, don't, interrupt, no, don't let me interrupt you. Let's continue the discussion, and I'd like to hear uh, what the next passage would be and, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Sam. And uh, I certainly understand about priorities. And, uh, you know, your family and children have to 
be a top priority be before participating in, in these fellowships. And so, but I'm glad whenever you are available to join us, it's, I'm always happy to see you. Uh, I'm going to move on now to this. Uh, oh, well, we want to look at this in context. Um, this is, uh, we're looking at Acts uh, 26 18, and uh, it says, you, that you may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And that made me pose the question, uh, is it fair to say that if someone is not a child of God by being born again, I mean, you know, the world thinks of and we're all children of God. The typical attitude of all the people in the world is, yes, we're all, everybody in the world, we're all brothers and sisters because we're all part of humanity and we're all children of God because God's the creator. But we know the scriptures say that the only child of God is someone who's born again as a child of God. And therefore, the default position is that um, if you're not a child of God, you're a child of the devil. And there are verses that, that can support that. I asked Brother Bill to a answer that. And so the other thing I would ask related to this is I, I believe that all the religions of the world are really different forms of Satanism. Because there's only there's only two religions. If, I hate to call it Christianity a religion, but there's only two things, two camps. You have Christianity, those of us who put our faith in Christ as our Savior, and then everybody else. Uh, but everybody else, no matter what they call themselves, whether it's Buddhism or Islam or Roman Catholicism or anything else or atheism, any of these groups of people, they are all really part of one thing, and that is Satanism. Because you're either with Satan or you're with Jesus. Uh, that's how I see it. Uh, but uh, Brother Bill, I suspect you might think I'm taking that too far. But, uh, no, no. No, 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 no. Let me try and clarify then. See, I agree yet what you just said. The default position is, is your your if if you're not saved, you are in darkness. And, and Satan kind of rules the air in in that sense. That's the default position, which I agree with. But what I was trying to trying to say, and didn't come out actually very well, is that, that everybody who, who isn't a Christian yet isn't automatically possessed by Satan and demons. So I hope that clarifies it a little bit. But you're correct in saying the default button is either saved, belong to God, or unsaved. At the moment, they're in the dominion of Satan. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Bill. Uh, uh, Sam, if, if you want to comment on that, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on to another verse. Well, you know, like, I don't have... Um, uh, Special comment. I would just like to agree that uh, yeah, it's either all or, or um, as Christ said, He didn't come to uh, to bring peace, so to say. Uh, he came to bring sword, you know, to divide. Um, it's either you are one of the wheat or the tares. It's either other uh, man-made uh, religion. That's based upon the work of man versus uh, so-called Christianity, uh, the work of God. So, meaning Jesus Christ. So, yep, I'd like to just uh, emphasize that, Brother Luke. Okay, thank you, Brother. Um, uh, I'm not surprised that we agree on this. And uh, I, I do think that many people who understand biblical Christianity would agree with our statements here. But I think the world as a whole would, would react to this as kind of, a, maybe we've, we've all gone insane. Maybe we're just extremists and Jesus freaks or something because we're, we're stating this as that there's only two things. You're either saved or lost. You're either a child of the God or you're a child of the devil. Not necessarily possessed by demons, but you're with them. There's only two camps you can be in. You're by default. You're in the wrong camp. You're you're lost and you're in darkness. And the only way to get saved and in light is through Jesus Christ. So that seems like an extreme thing to the world, but Jesus couldn't have been more clear. He said that uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No 
man comes to the Father, but by me. So he drew the line in the sand, and he made it exclusive, and said he's the only way. So there are people that are offended by that, but I think this is part of the essential of Christianity. That well, I, I, sorry, I just want to interject. Is that all right, just for a second? Yeah. It's just that I, I think Colossians 1.13 helps us in understanding this. And it even actually sounds, you know, quite good, you know, in, in all translations, not just the King James. Is, is it okay if I read that? Yeah, and it says, you know, this is obviously Colossians 1.13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? You know, other versions, you know, rescued us from the dominion or, or, or and the power of. And so basically, what he's saying there, I believe, is that, yeah, we agree that, that not everyone who isn't saved, you know, is, isn't, you know, by default possessed by the devil, but they're under his, his dominion. His domain, you know, and he's certainly his influence. I think that helps to clarify a bit. Okay, all right, thank you, brother. I'm going to move on to the next verse here. Uh, so now we get, let's look at Romans 16 20. And the God of peace will quickly crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Uh, Romans 16 20. So the God of peace will quickly crush Satan under your feet. Um, we'll look at that in context, but first you have a reaction to that? I would say, uh, amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's true. We certainly will be under thought. But like I said, I think it's important that that, that you know, for people who are listening, you, you bring the context out, Luke, which I, I'm sure you will. Okay, yes. Uh, I made a point when I started the, the show today talking about the importance of context. And so, I, yeah, I think that uh, to me, two of the most important um, uh, principles of Bible study is, is first the context, you have to look at the uh, the verses before and after it. Maybe look at the, the whole the point of the entire chapter. Maybe look at the whole point of the, the why the book was written, who wrote it, who they're writing it to, what's the purpose of the book. And then you got to also keep it in, in biblical context so that it, it, uh, you understand how it fits in with the entire uh, Bible. Uh, so context is the first thing. And then the second thing, of course, is, as I said earlier, we have to get a lot more weight on our conclusions, uh, they deserve, the clear verses deserve a lot more weight than the, the fuzzy verses that are hard to understand. So if something is stated very clearly, we put more confidence in that than something that is everybody's trying to figure out. We don't really know what it means. Uh, so here again, we go to context, and uh, let me see. This is uh, uh, Romans sixteen. Uh, what was it, 1620? Okay, uh, I'm going to start with verse 17. And the subtitle of this verse is not scripture, but it says it's about av avoid divisions. So we got Paul writing this and saying, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they for they, they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay, so we have uh, we have the context of that verse now. So uh, go ahead and, and reply to that, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, the context is right there. It, it, it was it was a time as the church was was still young, as we know, and there were so many 
you know, preaching. What we have seen nowadays again, history has repeated itself. You know, doctrine that is contrary to, to, to what Christ taught and his apostles taught. You know, we see that throughout, you know, Christendom now. You know, the classic example is work salvation. Or, or even the word and faith gospel, you know, it's all about money, 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 me, me, me. You know, and that certainly fits into the context, the word and faith movement, because they're only interested in their own belly. They're only interested in their own profit. You know, and, and, and Jude even goes on explaining this happened, doesn't it? You know, that, that some have crept in unawares. So, you know, yeah, I think that, that is clearly the context that, that, that Satan w w was causing division within within the newly formed church, but obviously the Apostle Paul comforts, you know, the brethren there, saying soon maybe he's going to be crushed, you know, he's going to put under foot. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, before I comment, I want to ask Brother Sam if he has to, wants to add to that. Oh, no, I, I agree with uh, Brother Bill. Thanks. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, there, there is actually an awful lot in that those few verses there that are relevant to this, um, but of course the first thing we're trying to look at is learn. We're trying to learn about Satan today, and who he is, what he's, what he does, and, and you know, uh, so that we can we can learn. The more better we understand him, the better we can uh, defend ourselves and others against him. Uh, but it says that. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. So I think Paul is trying to reassure everybody that uh, um, even though Satan is stirring up trouble, and even though there's all these divisions and, and everything, he's he's uh, saying that uh, uh, eventually uh, God is going to take care of Satan, and uh, he will be uh, dealt dealt with. And uh, so the but it really boils down to, as, as Bill said, the idea that there's these problems in the early church. But I've said this numerous times over the years, that all the problems I see in the epistles and in Acts, uh, I see the same problems today. Uh, there, there's, you know, they say nothing new under the sun. Well, when it comes to false teachings, all the false, false teachings that we spend our time refuting today, they, they were all uh, evident in the beginnings of the church. And so here you have all these divisions, but he's say, telling us, mark them, which cause divisions, and it says, avoid them. So we are justified once we've determined that somebody is stirring up trouble in the body and over a false doctrine. Now, if they're stirring up trouble in other ways, you know, it's not necessarily the issue here. It's talking about um, uh, deceive the hearts of the simple. Um, so these people are deceiving uh, the, 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 the believers uh, and leading them astray, and we're supposed to find out who they are, mark them, point them out, and then separate ourselves from them. And you know, I've, I've used the word shunning in the past, and I know a lot of people don't like the word, but when it says that we should avoid them, mark them, and avoid them, uh, I think that that could fall under the definition of shunning. You, you don't want to associate with somebody who is, who is like that. And so, uh, but in the end, he says that he's trying to reassure them, but don't worry, God, God's going to deal with Satan. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll go on unless uh, uh, you guys want to add to that. Well, I'd only just like to add, if you look at the, the verse as well, it names numerous saints that this division is, is causing problems to. So it was a real, as you say, a real massive problem. You know, then, and as we say, even today, we can see the same sort of problems and divisions yeah, maybe under different names, etc. But but you know the same thing. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the next verse, and we're gonna we're gonna see a common theme in, in a lot of these things when we talk about Satan or the devil, 
uh, and so we can learn really what is, is he's up to and how he operates and and how much are we really justified in in naming Satan as the problem uh, sometimes it could be our own flesh and sometimes it is demonic attacks trying to stir up trouble within the body but Satan's is certainly blamed an awful lot of times in here uh, we're gonna look now at 1 Corinthians 5 5 uh, and it says, are to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. Oh, yeah. And that, that, that is on the same thing, you know. We, we know, and for anyone who doesn't know we're talking about, we're talking about the, the man that, that was actually that bad, that he was actually sleeping with his stepmom. So, you know, this is real hardcore, you know, <laughs> hardcore sin, you know, from a church, you know, from a saved person, you know, so it shows you that, that you know, though he wasn't possessed, I don't believe, and he can't be, he was certainly influenced by Satan so much so, you know, that they had, we possibly had to hand him over to the very Satan that was influencing to give him a good hiding, you know, so, you know, so that he would learn. And, and we know, you know, without spoiling the whole story, when you come to the second, you know, letter to the Corinthians, you know, we, we, we get the hint that he came back and he was sorrowful, and we was told to, to, to welcome back such such as those. I'm I'm all for um, letting Satan do the dirty work and stuff. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, uh, we're, we're told to um, be aware some people are out there trying to deceive us. When we, when we identify them as a deceiver, we should mark them, let everybody know that person's a deceiver, and then avoid them, don't associate with them. Uh, and, and then in, th in this case, this person, he's... Uh, um, he's in a position where the church is judging him and saying we need to get him away out of the body. There is certain kinds of behaviors, I guess, that Paul talks about. Hey, why are you bothering me with this? Can't you make these decisions? Can't you make these own judgments? Don't you know someday you're going to judge the angels? You've got to learn to make judgments. And uh, so sometimes the church has to judge it within the congregation whether somebody is so out of line that they need to be turned over to Satan. And this is the case where this person, they made a decision, Paul made a decision that he, he can't be in the body. He cannot be in the fellowship. Even though he's a believer, he can't be in the fellowship. Let's just kick him out and, you know, he, let Satan deal with him. And eventually, maybe he'll come, he'll come back. Uh, but he's still saved. But... You know he can't. He, we can't associate with him for, for whatever the reason. You think that's a correct conclusion there or not? Yeah, spot on. Spot on. Because you know Corinth had enough problems as it is <laughs> with all the things that was going on in there, and and this bloke was really bringing the, the whole church in Corinth into disrepute. So yeah, it had to, you know harsh measures, you know had to be taken. Obviously in love. Because the general consensus was he was still saved and he just needed a good holding. And then, you know, when he comes back to his sentence to welcome him back, and, you know, with, with arms from wide open. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you've ever had to do that. Uh, I, I've never really felt comfortable. I mean, I, 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 I've had a home church for, for seven years at my house and uh, it's. It, I don't any longer have it. Eventually, everybody's gone their own way and moved away and stuff. But uh, it was a wonderful time in my life for seven years. But I'm. Let me see. Uh, okay. Let me let me get this. Hang on just a second. Hello, well, Mark. Uh, I'm doing my live show right now. I love your music time, brother Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. You do it. You have to do the elevator music. I'm, I'm no good at that. <laughs> oh, it's back. It's back. Yeah, we've got to behave now. Luke's back. Let's behave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 
I am sorry. Normally, I, I I wouldn't want to have an interruption like that, but that was my son, and when he calls, I I never want to miss a call, so I let my wife talk to him. Uh, but I personally have uh, I've been in a position where I really gave it a lot of thought and prayer, even discussed it with some of the others in the congregation whether we need to address a particular problem and make it an issue and and. Uh, uh, I didn't. We didn't do it. Uh, we didn't do anything about it. Uh, and, and eventually, it actually turned out really quite well because uh, uh, the the issue it was uh, someone associating and dating and being involved with an unbeliever. You know, we're not supposed to be unequally yoked. And and uh, uh, that, but he ended up that the other. Uh, the person that was being uh, the Christian who was dating the unbeliever, uh, I was able to witness to the unbeliever, and they got saved, and they've been married for many years, and they're just very happy Christians now. But we were trying to make a decision of whether we should put our foot down over a, you know, a believer dating an unbeliever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said that because I, as you know, brother, we, we spoke often times in private. You know, I used to run a, a Bible group here a few years ago, and then, I won't mention names. There was a particular individual. You know, I didn't go so far as say, "Oh, I hand you over Satan and stuff," but he was barred from coming to this group because, you know, flamboyantly and, and privately, you know, he was selling drugs. He was fornicating. He was, you know, actually some of the stuff he was doing was shameful and embarrassing. You know, so we we got to the point where we had to say, right now you can't you can't come here because there's other people coming to the group and we can't have them influenced by you know you selling the drugs, you sleeping around, you doing this, that, and everything else. So so we had to yeah we had to just excommunicate him if that's the correct word. You know, in love. But you know that that's that only the one time we ever had to do that in all the years we we run our Bible group. But that wasn't obviously because you know we despised what he was doing. He was still a same person. and still is a same person. But the problem was that we was worried about the influence coming on to other you know new Christians who were coming into the little group. So we was protecting them. Yeah. Uh, that to me was like one of the most difficult things I had to face uh, uh, in all of my ministry work, and, and uh, it's—I don't know—I I really struggled thinking maybe I'm weak, uh, maybe I'm just not being strong enough. It all in this case it happened to all work out well, but uh, I really struggled with it, and uh, I was questioning whether uh, you know I was just being too weak not and not standing up to something, but. Sam, do you want to say anything about that whole concept before we move on? Well, you know, what's got to be done, got to be done, you know. So, you got to, I mean, there is certain, even just online, you know, there are certain things that you got to draw a line. So, same thing in, in, in the church, you know, if, if it's going to be out of order, then... <laughs> Some kind of order order has to be taken place. So, yeah, I concur with uh, you two gentlemen. All right, we'll go on to the next verse, and it is First uh, Corinthians seven five. Don't deprive one another unless it is by consent for a season, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and maybe together again, that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Um, okay, so I, I'm not sure we need a lot of context on this one, but uh, uh, we're, the whole point is Satan, it, it's possible that Satan could be tempting them. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is actually, believe it or not, that is quite a, a fundamental one because that, that is a real weakness for men. And if there's any temptation that's going to come towards men, you know, if there's problems within the you know, the marital situation and, and there's no give or take, I'm trying to say this without mentioning or, 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 or creating any innuendos here, 
but yeah, that is a, that is a very weak spot for most full-blooded males. That, that if if they're not having knowledge, so if they're not having knowledge with one another, that then men are very tempted, and the devil would absolutely have a field day with tempting men in that area. So yes, yeah, quite quite important with this one. There you go. Okay, I've got so many screens I'm using right now that it's a get, I'm getting confused about turning my mic off sometimes. But uh, yeah, when we look at this in context, I had actually forgotten the context of this, uh, and I, I think it is important to see the context here. Uh, if we start at first one, first Corinthians seven one, it says, "Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote of me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman." Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud not ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not uh, for your incontinency. Uh, okay, um, now we have the context, and I wasn't even, I didn't even put this in together with the, the right context originally, but. Uh, I've, all, I've always thought this verse is very important, the whole, not the verse, but the whole chapter and maybe the chapter around it, because I know a lot of young Christians, and I'm 64 years old now, and I've been married for 35 years, uh, but I remember very much when I was young the, the power of this sex drive, and fortunately I've been blessed that it's not overpowering to me, you know, and I can think of, I can do other things without being totally obsessed with the sex drive all the time. But it's a powerful thing. And I have always felt, really felt compassion for the young Christians. It seemed like maybe I can understand the men even more than the women, but the young Christian men in their teenage years, early 20 years, and so on, that, uh, and I've referred them to this part of the scriptures. That Paul's basically telling us, look, I wish you could be like me, Paul. Uh, I'm not married, and I can put all I put all my time into the ministry, and I'm not I'm not uh, driven with this sex drive. Uh, you know, I, I I don't I'm not struggling with it, and I'm not being tempted into into um, uh, promiscuity and uh, fornication. Uh, uh, but you might not be like me. Maybe you're somebody that has a powerful sex drive, and, and, and because of that, you're going to uh, want to be a fornicator. And, and if that's the case, uh, rather than fornicating, get married. And then you can, you can have, use marriage as the means of satisfying this need you have, and that's the way it was intended. Uh, but now, what, even though you're, once you're married, you've got to be careful that you do not deprive each other. When either partner has this need, the other partner should satisfy them. And that's not always an easy thing in a marriage, too, that uh, both husband and wife consent to that one. But if they do, if they're always willing to satisfy the other uh, when those needs arise, then... Paul says they're not going. To, you're not going to be sexually frustrated, and get and and be tempted by Satan to go out and commit adultery. So again, he's he's, he's blaming Satan. Satan's being mentioned all the time as the one that's tempting them and you know, taking them off on on the wrong way. But uh, in this case, it seems to me it's much more just uh, the flesh. The, what's 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 within every person is if they're a healthy young person, especially this powerful sex drive, and that that's really what is going to be tempting them. Uh, please please reply to that. Well, yeah, spot on. It's absolutely spot on, and that is why 
Now, even if, if say you've done a web search, the two things that come up Hello. mostly with the most hits, most views, most searched item is either God or sex. And that shows you how much you know of an influence that this, this, this it is a natural God given gift, you know, in their correct context, but it is a massively powerful drive, especially for men. And that is why, you know, <laughs> your bottom board clearly says this, you know. You know, you need a better give and take here because the, as eggs is eggs and as day is day, Satan will tempt a man there straight away. I've, uh, we had a comedian here many years ago. I don't, can't remember what his name was, but he was on TV all the time. And he had this saying that he used all the time. Like, he says, the devil made me do it. <laughs> And it was, you know, it was funny. Everybody, everybody thought you know, that, that was a good laugh. Uh, but sometimes in the scriptures, it seemed like uh, the devil is the scapegoat as far as being blamed for everything. Like the devil made me do it, and I don't didn't have a free will, and I had my, I didn't have a flesh and a sin nature that was factored in at all. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have another group of people that. Say, the devil didn't make you do it. God made you do it because God controls everything you do. These Calvinists say that you don't even have a free will. Everything you do, God's making you do it. So God's being blamed for it. And in this case, it looks like this devil's being blamed for it. But it seems to me that, yeah, the devil is a tempter and a deceiver, and his demons are busy at work in our lives, uh, and we have a spiritual war going on. But people have to accept some personal responsibility that, you know, they do have a free will. Would you please respond? Yeah, I'll, I'll just respond just in, in agreement to that. Yeah, completely in agreement. And this is why he makes the point, you know, because it, it isn't the devil going into people possessing them where they have no control over it. So it is a matter of self-control. And that is why Paul gives this advice, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, this is, you know, don't be selfish, you know, within, within the bedroom. You know, there's a better give and take. Because otherwise there's going to be Satan will tempt you, and, and you will lose your self-control, and, and you're going to be in a predicament. Well, anyway, you know, when, that kind of reminds me of, uh, also at the same time, I know it's not really exactly the same example, because, uh, Job was righteous, but when when God was using Satan, you know, to prove to prove his point, so to say, you know. Hmm. I wonder, you know, if if you were uh, Job, I wonder if uh, if you would be okay with that sort of, um, you know, uh, God making a certain point. With Satan, what do you, what, I don't know. I'm just kind of. Uh, what do you think, brothers? Um, Brother, I have a lot of Job verses on our, my list here to discuss, so I don't mind jumping forward to that. Let's find some some Job verses here, since you brought that up. Um, okay, uh, Job one six. Now it happened on the day when the gods. The sons came to present themselves before Yahweh. Uh, I wonder what tra translation that is. Uh, that Satan also came among them. Uh, let's look at Job 1 6 here. I'll find it in context. Job 1. Okay, 1 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Uh, now this is really interesting, and I'm not sure I understand this that well at all. Maybe you guys can really help me with this, but I'm going to read this in context, uh, starting with uh, verse 1. Uh, this is Job 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. I think that's... It's spelled U-Z. 
There was a man in the land of Uz that whose the breaking up where the their loop. It was completely broken up and, and frozen. I can't, I can't hear you at all, Luke. If you're still there, can, can you write something in the chat, Mark? Because yeah, you're completely frozen and there's no sound, mate. I, I thought it was uh, just my end. Uh, how, how, how do I s sound? Do I sound all broken or choppy or anything? No, you sound fine. It's literally Luke it has completely gone silent and, and is frozen. Hmm. We have an issue here. Well, I'm sure it's that. I'm sure it's the Google. Don't like Christians at the moment, you show, because it happens every single every single Christian hangout is either Aero 403 or they're crashing out or being logged out, and there's something funny going on. Interesting. You've been marked already. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, count, count, count oh, a blessing, eh, that we're counted worthy for all this crap, even from Google. <laughs> Oops, uh oh, that's not good news. No, that's not so long. That five no. minutes was Right, now he has five minutes. Right. Oh, dear. Come back, come back. Yeah. What, what, what is, oh, no, he's back, he's back. <laughs> oh, there go. oh, boy. I'm sorry. I was read all that part of Job, but I don't know how much you heard, but uh, we have uh, nothing noticed it. I noticed when I asked you guys to respond, nothing happened. I somehow had to get the connection back. But uh, did you hear me read those first few verses of Job? No, we heard you read the chapter and a verse saying, I'm going to read from Job chapter 1, verse, and then you went. Okay, uh, let me try this again then, okay? I, or unless you guys were carrying on without me and need to go on with what you're saying. No, we was tempted to. We was waiting for you. We had a little bit of time. <laughs> you're so tempted did. by the devil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with carnal thoughts. Okay, here goes. This is really interesting. It's the first five verses of Job. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, and 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so. When the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and burnt off and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Wow. Okay, you're, you're still there. I went back to the screen. I see you're still there. That's good. I'll, t I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you, not not yeah. just from those verses, but, but the, the whole you know book of Job in general, I see, I don't know if anyone else does, but I see a parallel with the Apostle Paul. Now, you know, the Apostle Paul was, was tempted and throws the arse of the Lord, you know, to take away this thorny side, you know, after the people kept tormenting him all the time. And God said, "My grace is sufficient for thee." And I see that a similar parallel, you know, because you know, poor old Job, he blamed this, he blamed that, he blamed himself, and 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 the advice he got from his friends, you know, weren't much help because they was condemning him as if he'd done something wrong. But I think it was basically, as God said, you know, that that he was a righteous man. God loved him, 
and, and Shun clearly, you know, told the devil, well, well, do what you want with him, but obviously don't kill him. And, and God was proven there the same point that he proved the apostle point that his grace is sufficient and it was all going to be all right in the end. So that's where I see a parallel. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Amen, uh, brother. That's how it runs. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, very good. I, I, I've never uh, seen the parallels in that before. Just another example of being able to learn from another brother. It, uh, uh, it is interesting, the, the parallel you've drawn. And what I was am amazed by, and I, I read the whole Bible numerous times, and, and there I go back to certain parts of the Bible over and over again and study it out and stuff. But uh, Job, uh, I've probably read several maybe three times and it's a, one of amazing stories uh, and we can learn a lot from it and it really bothered me and puzzled me from time to time uh, but what I got from these first five verses is just how amazing Job was in terms of how he was blessed by God with all this abundance all this wealth the the wealthiest man in the eastern part of the world and and and, and how he did you notice how he was doing offerings, burnt offerings? Now, let me ask you uh, a couple of things about the book of Job. At what point in history did this happen? And at what point was was uh, the book of Job written, in your opinion, if you have one? Yeah, my opinion is it's, it is before the law, before Moses. Really, technically, if the Bible was chronological, you had Genesis, Job chucked in somewhere around Genesis, and then the other books following. So it is, it is the earliest book. It was before the law. It was before the sacrifices that, that, that God desires from us, you know, to be like a temporary covenant. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's quite a, an amazing book that, that, that even Job sent, or, 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 or some was in part of him at some point, that, that, that he was making. You know, sacrifices. You know, it's almost like a picture before the law, and the law was a picture before Christ. You know, the ultimate sacrifice. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. Right. I've got a chronological Bible somewhere up there. I, I don't want to take the time to search through all of my Bibles and books and stuff to find it, but um, I, I'm curious to see how they would place the book chronologically. Uh, for that matter, I'd like to know how they place uh, the other books that we've discussed in the past with uh, Acts, James, Galatians, Hebrews, and so on. But uh, I'll check into that later. But I, I, I do think that James, I mean, uh, Job is uh, uh, generally recognized as one of the oldest, if not the oldest book, the first book actually written. Because uh, it, it, I don't think Moses is given credit for writing it. Uh, I think they, they attribute it to somebody else writing it. Maybe Job himself wrote I don't know. But uh, it was the events happened before Moses. Uh, and so they generally people think that it's the first book penned. And, and, and when did it play out in history? I think you're, you're right. It was would be somewhere between Genesis and Exodus here or just, and before uh, you know, uh, uh, Abraham and, uh, well, obviously before Noah. Uh, yeah, I, do you think it would be before Noah? And I hadn't th really thought about that. I personally think it was after Noah, but certainly before, uh, because it's not mentioned as a Drew or, or any of the tribes or anything like that. So it would have been, you know, before, before Abraham. After yeah. Noah, before I died. Well, one thing that stood out to me when I read it a few minutes ago was the uh, the, uh, the burnt offerings. Now, a burnt offering is an animal sacrifice. And so you can see that these animal sacrifices were happening before um, Moses started the, the Mosaic laws and, and uh, the Mosaic uh, animal sacrifices. We even have... Uh, the first example of that was the uh, uh, king uh, 
in Abel, whenever Abel was offered an animal sacrifice and, and Cain offered the labors of his hand through farming. So we know that these animal sacrifices were going on long before the, they were uh, described in Mosaic Law. And so here we see it in Job. Job was regularly, continually doing these animal sacrifices. Okay, let's well, let's move on unless uh, you guys want to add something before we look at the next couple of verses. Well, I just yeah. want to add in a little. Uh, if we read further on the book of Job, uh, that uh, you know, you'll notice that um, his friends, so-called friends, acquaintances, or, or friends, or what have you, uh, they come. They come to. Con you know, comfort uh, Job, yet you will find them uh, condemning Job when, of course, uh, when it, it is clearly written that Job was very uh, righteous, you know, as Brother Bill has put it, you know, he was perfect and upright, uh, one that feared God and eschewed evil. So, that's like that's like one that's a one good preacher right there, you know. <laughs> so so when uh, when these his friends just came and just condemned him until God intervened, you know, we we can pretty much expect the similar thing uh, uh, that might have happened maybe with uh, with with Apostle Paul and. Even nowadays, uh, if you are involved with, with any sort of drama at all, but I'd like to like um, continue. But I gotta like in ten minutes, I gotta take off um, for a hangout that I'll be having. So, so if I'm just gone somehow, then you know, please uh, pardon me in advance. Yeah, you knew. Was he muted, Luke? Yeah, you know, okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's there's several more verses that I'm going to read in sequence in Job that mention Satan, and so we get an idea of what Satan is up to here. Uh, okay, it's uh, well, Job six one six. Now it happened on that day when God's sons came to present themselves before the Lord, that Satan also came among them. Uh, the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord, uh, Let me see. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it, in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast, hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand, and his substance is increased in the land. Put, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself uh, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Uh, wow, what an interesting, fascinating uh, dialogue and agreement they made. Well, what do you think of that, brothers? Oh yes, no, it's, it's amazing, and that's that's you know, and that that's why I suppose as you just said, why I see such a parallel with, with the Apostle Paul, you know, that that Satan was allowed. To, to to torment Job, but obviously not allowed to kill him, and, and obviously that 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 Paul's fawn on his side was, was was allowed to go on, you know, to buffer him, you know, in in, in 
in regard to Paul, it was, I suppose, to keep him humble so he, he wouldn't exalt himself above measure. And, and with obviously Job's case, it was God proving the point that, that, that this man is loved by me and loves me. You know, and this is despite, you know, all, all you know, even if you take away all the stuff that I've given him, he's still going to love me. That's, that's an amazing story. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I'm interested in your, your uh, reaction to the devil kind of making this deal with God. And, uh, you know, it says that Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Uh, it seemed like Satan is kind of tempting him and like putting this idea and say and, and making a uh, a challenge to God, saying Job's not as good as you think, and that uh, it's only because you blessed him so much. If you take away all his blessings, he'll curse you to your face. And God said, "Okay, take it all away and see." So it seemed like he is really. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that God would even be having this dialogue with Satan at this time and that Satan can actually come before God. Why is Satan even allowed to come and have a conversation with God? Wasn't he already cast down from heaven and exiled? What is he doing having a dialogue with God and, and being allowed to go out and persecute Job? Any answers to that? <laughs> yeah, the only answer I can give to that is, is, is one of them mind blowing, you know, scriptures. It really is. It just blows your mind. There's so, there's so much going on there. You know, you know they, yeah, you've got the initial scriptures, but you can see so much going on in the background and, and, and in the mind of God and in the mind of Satan. And, and in, there's so much there. To, to grasp that, then through just a few verses of scripture, it blows my mind. You know, we, we, we can glean basic things out of it. Yeah, that, that, that God, you know, this person, I'm, I'm going to prove this person loves me because of me and not because of all the blessings and, and things I've bestowed upon him. We can glean simple things like that, but it goes deeper, doesn't it? You know, what, why did God allow Satan, as you said, you know, <laughs> not to tempt God? Yeah, as if Satan was there and God kind of indulged him for a moment and said, oh, wait, come on, throw, you know, give, me, throw, give us your best shot and I'm still going to come out trumps. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I, I find it interesting that Brother Sam has led us into Job and he's leaving us for us to figure it out. I could see. Well, you know, I, I, guess, it, I guess it's not... Um, it's not the end of this um, broadcast after all. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. I, there's no way I, I'm going to be able to end this subject of the Satan and the Devil today. I've got another topic I'm very anxious to move into, but I guess I'm going to have to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, like, when you look at the book of Job, it's not the only first time Satan uh, is uh, come before uh, you know, come forth the uh, before God. You know, he came like like a couple of times at least. You know, so but whatever he whatever it is, uh, whenever whenever God asks Satan where he has been, he always says, um, you know, from going to and fro. Always interesting the character of Satan. Always, what he does is going to and fro, you know, looking for his prey, so to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, there's a there's a lot more we're gonna be saying about Job here, but I, I want to say that uh, I, I I struggled with Job over the years because I could not understand why God would. What was the word you used, Brother Bill? Uh, uh, permit Job or uh, humor Job or something like that. Uh, indulging. God is indulging. And God is indulging Satan, I mean. He's allowing Satan to, to put God on the spot and, and prove uh, and let him show them that 
Job's not that good, and he's only he's only good because of his blessings, and God indulges him, allows him to do it. Why would God do that? I've always I've struggled with that. I did come to a conclusion, and I'll tell you now, uh, if, if you want, and then you can tell me if you you have some other theory about this, but I think that uh, God allowed Job to go through this, and, and, and then Job or someone write this down so that you and I can be reading it today, and so that we can be discussing all these things, and so that we can be learning all these things. This is the reason it was allowed, is for us to ponder it, and learn about God and learn about this whole experience and uh, learn, you know, there's a saying of the patience of Job. I don't think that term is actually in scripture, um, but the uh, the story of Job is probably one of the most famous stories in the scriptures, even in the secular world, among all the other religions of the world too. Job, the character of Job and the story of Job is, is well known by a lot of people. And what can, why? Why is it there? Why did it happen? What can we learn from it? I think it's, we can conclude in 2014, Brother Luke, I, I went through the hardest year of my life. And, and then I, and I could have like cried about it. I could have just like been all depressed and, and just let it get overwhelm me. But then I could also think about Job. And, and compare. It's like the man that had no shoes and he felt so uh, uh, deprived. And then he, he met a man who had no feet and he gave him perspective. And I think this Job um, this story gives everyone perspective. Look what Job went through. Because your life, does your suffering compare to that? And look how Job handled it. God never, Job never did what his so-called friends told him to do uh, and his wife told him to do, curse God and die. Just Why don't you just, Job, just get over it, curse God and die. Why are you not doing that? But Job never cursed God. And his friends, with friends like that, <laughs> you don't need enemies. They were just trying to stir up trouble and put, uh, and, and make, make and, and tell Job, it's kind of like people have told me in the past, these people who believe in the, the, the faith healing and the prosperity message, that if you pray, it's, you're going to get your prayer answered. If you ask for healing, you're going to get it. If you ask for wealth, you're going to get it. If you don't get it, if you don't get a yes answer from the Lord, then that means, one, you didn't have enough faith, or two, there's some sin in your life that's preventing it. That's the kind of friends that, that Job had. They were trying to say, the reason you're going through all this is because there's some kind of sin in your life. You need to figure out what the problem is and then confess it to God. And But but that wasn't the, what the, the cause at all. So I think, I think you've hit, spot on, you've hit the nail on the head twofold there, that, that, that Job was specifically written for, for those two purposes. Firstly and foremostly, to encourage you know the brethren now that, that suffer persecution and go through trials and tribulations and pain and, and all these things that happen, just to show you that, that that you're not alone. You know there was a man of God way before our time that suffered almost beyond measure, yet he was very beloved of God and loved God. So I think firstly the first nail in that is that that is an encouraging letter for us. And secondly, it exposes, because God knows things are going to happen before they happen, and God would have seen, no, in this, this false prosperity name it and claim it, you know, perverse canker on Christendom would come in. And it, it, this is sticks, you know, as, as, as like a sore thumb. You know, it shows you, no, this ain't true. Name it and claim it is out of rubbish. It is, it is perverse. Because God loves people, whether they're suffering, whether they're not. Whether they're wealthy, whether they're impoverished, you know, it isn't a matter of these, 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 these silly, you know, panicky, you know, details like wealth and what. So I think, yeah, the nails hit on the head twice really hard with Job. And thank, thank God for that book. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that's the best. That's the best I can come up with in trying to explain uh, all these problems we see in Job. But another problem I, I see that maybe you can help me with is that you know the scriptures tell us that uh, uh, no one is righteous, not even one. That uh, there is no one good, and uh, the very best, of, the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. And we know this is the the, the condition of man. And yet, with Job, uh, that he it says that he was righteous and perfect. I mean, please, can you reconcile that for me, if you know how? Well, the only way I can reconcile that is it's the same scenario as Abraham. That that Abraham had faith in this God, you know, and it was accounted to him as righteous. You know, he was righteous in the eyes of God because he had faith and loved this God. And, and the same, I suppose, the scenario is, is with Job. It wasn't that he was righteous in his, in his own flesh, but he loved, and we know that he loved this God. And, and, I, and I think that was accounted to him because of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and that well, that gets us to the question of, of this uh, salvation and dispensationalism and everything. That I've, I've made a lot of videos on that recently, too. And, and and the question is, uh, did man get saved differently in the past, and will man get saved differently in the future, like in the tribulation or millennial period? Does God have some kind of works-based systems in, in the past and in the future, but only now does he have grace for us? And uh, I've spent a lot of time proving that uh, uh, we've always, past, present, and future, Salvation is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in God alone. But now it's revealed to us that the God, the name of this God is Jesus and who he is and he became a man and so on. Uh, but I think in Job's time, it was the same thing where he had faith in God. He, he, even through all of that, look how his faith was, was uh, demonstrated. Uh, he, he never stopped believing in God. He, I mean, he... He had his questions about why God was doing it to him and stuff, but he would never curse God. That was really the, the question, wasn't it? Will you just curse God? And, and he never would resort to that, even though, you know, God gave him a good lecture, didn't he? He said, Job, can you create the universe? Can you do this? Can you do that? Look at the great things that I do, and you're, and you're questioning me? That was pretty amazing part of Job, too, wasn't it? Yeah, again, that's another mind blowing. Job is certainly for me the, the, the amazing mind blowing book in the Bible. It's got so much treasure within it. Although it's got hardship and suffering, that the treasure and, and the wonderment of God you can glean from that one book it is mind blowing. Yeah. I think that the, uh, God was actually uh, uh, pointing out the. Uh, Somewhat, you know, little tiny ignorance of Elihu, you know, the, the little younger one who came out at last, um, rebuking everyone, <laughs> you know, the true fruit inspector, and um, he was claiming to, you know, so to say, know it all, kind of self righteous, and then God comes out and, you know, so to say, and then who is this, you know, so called, what, what do you exactly say, you know? Somewhat like some like who is this ignorant someone and I don't know I should find that I'll let you know but and then I think it was Job something thirty seven or something but he wasn't talking to, yeah he wasn't talking about Job per se but he was he was talking to everyone of course including Job but he was talking to you know in response to that. Kind of self-righteous uh, remarks and comments that uh, uh, Elihu was making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I noticed, Bill, uh, you you put a post up that uh, you thought that the Book of Job was written by either Job or Elihu, one of his antagonists. 
Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the you know, there's no proof, no one knows exactly, but, but you know, the way that, that it's structured, you know, it doesn't point to, you know, who we would think that I, Moses, who wrote the first five books. The way it's structured is, is unlike anything else, so most historians would, would say, well, it's just, I've got to be written by Job or Elliot, you know, just because of the way it's structured. But no one knows for sure, as you said. No one knows exactly who read it, you know. But you know that, that that's the best guess we can have. Yeah, uh, I've I've read a lot of different explanations about uh, these different times we hear about Satan and and how they all fit in a timeline. And I've never really felt real confident in that, my understanding of it. But we 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 know that Satan uh, has. He's already fallen. There's already been a rebellion. It seems like there's another uh, case where there's going to be another rebellion, or uh, and, and then and then we see that this time in Job, where where even at that time in history, Satan has access to God, and it goes before God and and comes about and, and comes before God and to be an accuser. Uh, I just don't. I, I'm not really sure about the timeline of all these events, the fall and Job, and then uh, you know, Jesus Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven and like lightning. Um, do you have any, are you confused about that too, or, or, or do you have a good grasp of all of it? Oh, yeah, I'm a bit peculiar. I'm a bit peculiar because because like I said, nobody knows exactly when, but you know, we are entitled to to try and glean what we can out of scriptures and come to conclusions that that may be understandable, may help others. And, and, and in timeline, you know, I've read from Genesis, if you read Genesis, you know, in the six days of creation and including the seventh day of rest, all the days were called good and very good, apart from the second day. So for me, I've worked out, well, something bad happened the second day for God not to say it was good or very good. So perhaps that was the day that, 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 that Lucifer was cast out of heaven. And, and he is to and thrown ever since then. You know, he's still known as the, the accuser of the brethren. So he still accuses the brethren even now. And that's why we have Christ Jesus, who is our mediator, you know, who defends the brethren. But all I know for sure is that he's hovering around now and he's causing trouble. He's like a roaring lion, seeing he can devour. The accuser of brethren, and it's not, I suppose, until he's bound for a thousand years that that's going to that's going to come to a cessation. But up until then, whenever that is, I believe he's still got a certain limited range within God's own parameters that he's set to to, to hover around. You know, accusing it and being a pain in the backside. All right. Uh, the um, I just want to add in the passage that I was looking for. So Elihu was talking uh, until Job thirty-seven, and then and Job thirty-eight. The, and then the Lord answered Job out of the uh, wind and said, Who is this that darkened counsel by words without knowledge? See, so God is asking Job here about Elihu, right? So, you know, God was not talking about Job. Because, you know, God is going to go through all this, so to say, the things that, hey, have you been there? Have you, you, know, have you seen this? All the bunch of lists. So whoever that self-righteously rebuking, because, like, we know for sure that, um, as, it, as we saw in chapter 1, that, you know, it is given that Job is righteous. Job is perfect before God. So he is justified before God already. So for anyone to rebuke him in such a way, saying that he is unrighteous, was not really right. And plus this person coming out of blue, so to say, uh, Elihu being self-righteous, and then just going all that spiel, you know, all that 
in, in two chapter. And then finally God is saying, uh, God is asking Job, you know, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> so to say. And then he's going all the things that, uh, have you seen that? Have you seen that? But anyway, I got to go get uh, get my, ready my hangout. Uh, Brother, we're going to cross... We're going to close this uh, show up right now. That I'm going to end with an invitation for salvation. So you can, if you need to go now, go ahead. Uh, cool. Uh, but we're going to only. All right. I'll, I'll, right. I'll stay as much as as I can. But if I if I'm not, then please, you know. Can, All right. You know, thank you for the invite and God bless you. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, brother Bill, I. There's a lot more verses about Satan and the devil, and I'm going to have to think about whether I want to go over the rest of them. I think we got, we I've covered so much ground on Satan and the devil that uh, uh, it's been pretty thorough as far as understanding who he is, what he's up to, how our struggles against him, and so on, uh, and and that Christians can't be possessed, but they can be, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, attacked spiritually attacked. So I'm not really sure I'll go on any further. Uh, I'm anxious to go on to that next topic anyway. Uh, but for now, the most important part of every show is the last few minutes when we, we tell everybody uh, how they can go to heaven. And I mean, a lot of people are watching now, and they, they already know, and they, they, they've already done what is required of them. Uh, but... There's probably some people watching this now, or maybe they'll watch this broadcast if it's up here long enough on YouTube, 10 years from now, and and they'll watch this and be interested, And but they never learned what's required of them so they can go to, go to heaven. So can we take this a moment now, Brother Bill? Tell the, the viewer, if they want to go to heaven, tell them what require, God requires of them. Yeah, yeah, basically, I'd like to just first start out and say that, you know, God didn't promise us a rose garden, but he did promise us eternal life through faith. And it's always been the way, so, you know, and that is true, you know, all the way from Job, you know, through to Abraham, through to, to everyone. You know, salvation has always come by faith, or you put in trust and belief in this God. Now this God, as we clearly described there, you know, is manifested on earth as Jesus Christ, who is God, manifest in the flesh. And he, you know, he, he loves everyone dearly. You know, we, we're sinners, we've fallen short of God's, you know, glory. You know, and, and as humans, we can never, we can never get to that point of perfection. You know, same as Job, he was a righteous man, and he was perfect but only in the sense that he had faith in this God, the same as Abraham. In the flesh he was imperfect. You know, and unfortunately, because we're all fallen short, we're all imperfect, the wages of this sin, i.e. the reward of the thing of imperfection, is death, or the second death. That God loves you so much this day, he desires not a single soul ever taste that second death. And that's why he came to earth, you know, in love, to seek and save all that was lost to make a full payment for a debt that we could never pay. And this is what Jesus has done for us. You know, and, and to be saved, we just need to, to put all our eggs in one basket. We need to believe on this Jesus Christ, you know, in faith and in trust, that he died for us because he loved us and made payment for all our wrongs, all our fallen shorts, all our missing the mark, that he was buried and he rose again. All right, being the first fruit of the resurrection, you know, and and and, and that is the beauty in that that, that 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 Christ Himself was raised from the dead, and and those who put their faith and trust in this Jesus Christ in faith could be the same as Him. They could be risen from the dead, come the last day. So I would encourage anyone, you know, just you know, you don't have to say massive prayers. You don't have to do. You know, jump through hoops and do somersaults to believe. You know, to be saved. You just need to really know that that you're a sinner. You're full and sharp. There's nothing you can do about it. But there is one who has done everything for you, and his name is Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him, in the fact that he loves you, and that he did die for all your sins, was buried and rose again. 
if you was to put your, your faith and trust in those facts, in whom they are which is Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will pass from death unto life, and you will receive the free gift through faith of eternal life. And like I said, although from the beginning you're not promised a road garden, you are promised an eternal inheritance. You are promised eternal life. And you are promised a paradise to come. So I pray that you would trust this Jesus Christ. That you put your trust in him, as Job did, and as Abraham did, and as all the saints of old have. Put your trust in this Jesus Christ, because he has power over life and death. But he loves you and desires you receive life this day. Amen. Yes. Amen. Brother Sam, he usually gives us applause at this point. You know, he says amen and applauds. And I guess he doesn't have his special effects all working right now. But I applaud, I applaud what you said. That's the, the true message of salvation. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And I'll just take a minute to kind of relate this to the whole subject of Satan. You know, as the, the, the man's problem started because man listened to Satan. Adam and Eve chose to believe Satan instead of believing God. In the garden, God told Adam and Eve that uh, don't take of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you'll surely die. They had a perfect situation. They could have lived with God and been in paradise. And he says, all you do, I don't want you to do is don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan deceived them and told them, no, what God told you is not the truth. The truth is, if you eat from the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will know what's good and what's bad, and you can go your own way. You won't need God. You can be like God. You can make your own decisions. And because of that, man fell lost his relationship with God, we're all destined to die, we've, in, we've inherited death from Adam and Eve, and, but God wants us not to have death, but to have life. So now he's, God's solved this problem and, and he's giving you another choice again, like Adam and Eve had a choice. Do you want to believe Satan or do you want to believe God? Satan is saying, go your own way. You don't need God. You can just do your own thing and get to heaven through your own efforts. All the religions of the world are based upon man working his way to heaven through some kind of religious ceremonies, religious practices, religious rules. And if you just do work hard enough, you can do it. You don't need God. That's what Satan wants you to believe. That's what most of the world believes. It's called the merit system. Personal merit system rather than trusting God. But what God wants you to, to do so you can go to heaven, what God requires of you is one thing, and that is to believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation. Don't believe in yourself. Don't believe what the devil said, that you can do it on your own. Instead, understand that you cannot do it through your own efforts. Admit, acknowledge that you cannot do it, and therefore you need help. You're lost, and you need to be saved. And there's only one Savior. Jesus said he's the only Savior. He's the only way. And as Brother Bill said, he is God, and he became a man so he could die for our sins. He did that. Sin's settled now. Your sins are paid for. Isn't that wonderful news? And he raised himself from the dead to prove to us all he can give us life. He raised himself from the dead. He can give us life everlasting. So the question for you now is, will you believe Satan or will you believe God? God says, trust Jesus. Satan says, trust yourself. Put your faith in Jesus. Don't put your faith in yourself. All right, Brother Bill, I'm going to give you the last word, and then I'll, I'll close the live broadcast. Yeah, all I really say is just, you know, confirm what you just said, that, that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Only God can save. All right, and this is what he done. He, he gave us this, this free gift of salvation 
And, and all we need to do is, as I said, just simply believe in faith that he's done it for us. You know, not because he had to, but because he loved to. So, yeah, I'll confirm completely what Brother Luther said. Believe this, Jesus Christ, and you will be saved this very day, this very second. You know, we're only mortals, but if you can just, you know, just that little tiny mustard seed of faith, put it all on to Christ, and you will pass your death unto life, and you will be with God forevermore. So believe that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, boy, I just can't help but being happy every time I hear this good news. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. We'll, we'll be here uh, next week again. I think next week I'll take Brother Sebastian uh, Dresden's topic and begin with that, and that is uh, the uh, eternality of Jesus Christ, uh, the question of his eternality. Uh, it'll be a fascinating study. So thanks for watching, and bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.